I wish I could be back there in person. Um, it's lovely to see familiar names and faces online. And um, I, I really hope that you're all well and, and uh, looking after yourselves um, and that we can resume uh, business as usual and I can get back on the 24 hour flight and, uh, and be jet lagged again soon. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Hopefully you can see um, what I'm seeing. Um, and I'll put the chat on as well in case anybody's got any comments. Hopefully that will work. All right. So yes, um, just to confirm, we can see. Okay, excellent. Um, so thanks uh, again for the chance to present today. This is um, a study which um, is uh, called the ACT3 study. And you see this guy on the picture there um, balancing on this very tenuous piece of bamboo that, and crossing a river in Kamau. And this picture is actually from the, um, the province in in which we conducted this study and given community-based active case finding, you can't always take a chest X-ray machine everywhere with you. And so um, we need to think about new solutions to, uh, to be able to access the communities that we, uh, that we want to screen. Um, uh, this is my declaration and I'll get stuck into it. So um, in this audience, I don't need to tell you the importance of TB. Um, we've uh, recently uh, been overtaken, uh, but historically TB is uh, the major um, cause of death and, um, and morbidity globally. And uh, there's been limited progress towards the ambitious goal of TB elimination. You can see here a figure from the most recent global TB report, which shows that the trajectory of our current decline, even prior to COVID, uh, was insufficient to, uh, to get us on a, a track yeah. for TB elimination. And um, so I think I can hear somebody uh, he's not muted there. It'd be great if you could mute. Um, and, um, and so even despite uh, the, the fact that uh, this was before COVID, we weren't making the, um, the trajectory required to, to get us to, uh, to TB elimination. And COVID as um, has been uh, reported in the most recent TB report has, has thrown those estimates off even further. Um, we know that the global distribution of tuberculosis um, uh, has a heavy um, bias towards resource limited settings and uh, about 62% uh, of people who develop TB each year live in the uh, Indo-Pacific region, which you can see there. Uh, and uh, that really shows why it's important to do research in that setting, uh, because if we're going to tackle the TB problem, we need to understand how we can find more TB in the most populous and, um, and heavily affected parts of the world. Uh, this is a figure, again, from the most recent global TB report, which indicates one of the major problems. So there's around 3 million people each year who develop TB but never reach um, appropriate health care. And that is across the age groups, you can see here, and for both males and females. And so this is a major barrier to being able to control TB. We've seen with COVID um, the importance of, of case detection and uh, the importance of um, Trans, uh, undetected uh, transmission in people where they're not um, known to have the disease. And uh, TB uh, with its airborne transmission has the same um, significant uh, public health challenges to actually be able to identify people before they have a chance to transmit. Now, the, the paradigm that has been dominant in resource limited settings for the last 50 years has been passive case finding, so-called passive case finding being people coming to the health facilities once they develop symptoms. Now, that paradigm has some important flaws, one of which is that many people with infectious TB lack the typical symptoms, such as cough and uh, sputum production and, uh, and uh, constitutional symptoms even. And so as a result, they may never um, or may very late um, decide that they will attend a health facility. Uh, and also in settings uh, where there is weak public health care, um, or fragmented public health care, it can be very challenging for people to actually reach the appropriate um, location where they can get the diagnostic test that will tell them they have TB. And so as a result, they can become very unwell and um, also transmit the infection before they get diagnosed. And this relates to the health system um, structural weaknesses uh, that, that are inherent in many countries. Um, and even when patients reach those health facilities, they may um, still uh, receive inappropriate treatment um, such as uh, single agent antibiotic therapy, or, uh, or they may be um, delayed in their diagnosis and therefore um, have poor outcomes. 
And part of this um, is challenging in TB because of the natural history of the disease. Um, the spectrum from latent TB to active TB um, is uh, often uh, a very heterogeneous uh, clinical presentation. And so some patients who have so-called subclinical TB where they may uh, not realize that they are unwell, but they are still infectious, um, can be responsible for, for ongoing transmission. And then patients may become um, symptomatic, but their symptoms may vary uh, significantly in, in their nature. Um, and there may also be a, a sort of an intermittent or transient um, uh, uh, symptomatic uh, presentation where patients may, uh, may have minimal symptoms periodically um, and then, uh, then revert to, to normal. Again, making it a, a real challenge. Uh, and the difficulties that we have in diagnostic testing of, of this intermediate population uh, which I won't go into in detail today, I think is one of the, the major challenges that we have in uh, being able to detect TB uh, in the community. One of the, the um, current paradigm around um, active case finding is that we, we tend to have a very narrow focus on particular high risk groups. So active case finding is where there, there is an effort made by the health system to go out and identify people who have active disease by performing screening or um, or more uh, proactive um, interventions to identify people uh, who may uh, require testing. The difficulty is that um, the high risk groups that we traditionally screen, such as household contacts or people living with HIV, in fact, numerically comprise a fairly small proportion of all the people in the community who are infectious. Um, other conditions such as diabetes have a higher population attributable risk, but still um, are uh, only a, a, a proportion of the people who are actually infectious. And so as a result, contact investigation um, and screening people who we know to be at high risk is unlikely to be sufficient to achieve elimination. And there's a lot of uncertainty around the uh, estimates uh, of, of the contribution of contact investigation or, or screening to, to overall TB transmission. But it's clear that um, in order to reduce TB incidence by 95%, uh, for example, um, we're not going to be able to just rely upon that method. Having said that, it's going to be an important part of the um, exit strategy once we do manage to get on top of community transmission. Um, I've mentioned the, um, the problems around symptoms as a, um, as a limitation for passive case finding. It's also a limitation for active case finding, which is that uh, in many settings, symptoms are used as the first um, uh, screening uh, uh, criteria for entry into active case finding. And it has been shown in many prevalence surveys, um, uh, including in Vietnam, many people, uh, perhaps uh, somewhere between half uh, and a third lack uh, the typical symptoms of TB when a prevalence survey is performed. And so this means that our reliance upon a purely symptom-based algorithm uh, as an initial uh, screening uh, or triage test um, is, is going to result in um, an under detection of, of cases and therefore um, is not going to be able to achieve the um, ambitious case finding goals that we need to achieve. And then the final point coming back to my first picture um, is that x-ray screening, which has again been the, the paradigm for screening in many settings um, has some limitations. And so uh, it may not be the, uh, the best way to be able to screen people for disease. Um, x-rays up until recently have been predominantly in um, centralized health facilities. They also have the limitation of requiring um, skilled interpretation and the problem of false positive testing. Uh, and so uh, for that reason, uh, it may be um, available and suitable in some settings, but for people such as those in remote rural Khmer province in Southern Vietnam, which I'll uh, show you in a second, um, X-rays uh, may not be the best approach. Having said that, there are a lot of new technologies, including portable x-rays and automated x-ray reading, which may lower the barrier to entry for x-ray screening. So taken together, that means uh, that, that we need new strategies. COVID has clearly slowed progress uh, for TB control, TB control in many settings. Uh, we did some uh, work in Vietnam and looked at the 2019 and 2020 patient cohorts, and we found about an 8% decline in TB notifications, which is actually pretty modest. Um, Vietnam's done very well in COVID, uh, but there's been much more dramatic declines in other settings. Um, and so in order to um, really achieve those goals of substantial um, TB reductions, such as 90% over the next 15 years, um, we're gonna need to do something differently. And so therefore there's gonna be a need for new active case finding strategies.
Now, this is just a slide which um, I, I've taken from Guy Marx that um, I think makes an important point. This is um, a slightly messy slide, but it shows you what happened in Australia with um, our TB um, local uh, mortality. So you can see on the left-hand side that um, uh, that deaths per 100,000 in the early part of the 20th century um, approached um, 150 to 200 per 100,000 in some age groups. And over the um, century, um, prior to antibiotic therapy, there was a gradual decline. But in the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, um, highlighted by the orange bar there, there was a national TB campaign, uh, which uh, was associated with um, a more rapid decline in TB um, deaths in Australia. And that campaign comprised active case finding using mass miniature radiography. Um, it included um, the payment of a TB pension for people who had been affected by TB. It included research and included capacity building in the health system. So many of the things that we now think about in terms of active case finding. Which brings me to the ACT-3 trial. So ACT-3 is a part of our, um, I guess, suite of, of ACT studies. Um, ACT stands for active case finding for TB. And um, this was the third study in that series. Um, you can see Vietnam here has uh, the unfortunate um, reputation as being both a high prevalence TB country and, uh, and also a high MDR TB prevalence country. Um, and so uh, it's uh, around um, 170,000 cases per year um, that have been reported in TB uh, in, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam is a low HIV prevalence setting. Um, there's, there's a concentrated epidemic among intravenous drug users, particularly concentrated in the um, large urban centers. Um, uh, and uh, TB uh, is thought to cause around 15,000 deaths per year in Vietnam. Now, this study was set in Kha Mau province, which is the southernmost province of Vietnam. And you can see here some of the, um, the ladies at the local market um, selling flowers in the morning. It's a lovely place. Um, and its uh, main agri industries are um, agriculture and, and fishing. Um, you can see here um, where it is on the map, so right down the south. And the TB notifications uh, a few years ago were 114 to 100,000. Um, and uh, there's about 1.23 million people live in this population. Now, now we chose um, this particular setting for this study because it was remote. Um, in Vietnam, there are two large cities. There's uh, Hanoi in the north and Ho Chi Minh City in the south. And there's a fair bit of migration from um, those two cities uh, to other parts of Vietnam. We wanted to choose um, a setting where there would be minimal um, internal migration and therefore if we did a case finding intervention there'd be less chance of reintroducing infection. Um, this is a picture from uh, a satellite showing some of the challenges of working in this setting. So this is in the Mekong Delta and you can see these brown lines here are the major tributaries of the of the Mekong and um, and so there's a lot of uh, challenges in getting across the province. Um, although it's fairly small it can take three or four hours um, by combination of motorbike, uh, bus or boat to get to some of the more remote places. Um, although that's a challenge on, on the other hand, it is actually uh, typical of the places where we need to perform active case finding if we're going to get on top of the TB pandemic in Vietnam and um, over half of the Vietnamese population um, still live in rural areas. So the, the study was um, uh, conducted amongst people aged 15 years and above um, and amongst the entire population uh, of uh, subcommunes uh, in Kamau province. And uh, I'll show you how we sampled those subcommunes shortly. The intervention that we performed was annual screening for tuberculosis, regardless of symptoms, by testing a single spontaneously expectorated sputum sample. Um, now, in contrast to some other screening algorithms, in the ACT3 study, every single person who was eligible to participate was asked to produce sputum. And so um, we... Uh, didn't require that they have a cough or any symptoms. And we didn't require that they even think that they could produce sputum. We just asked them to try and cough something up and put it into a container. Uh, and if there was at least half a mil of liquid that was produced, then we would test that at our lab. And I'll talk a bit more about what the testing involved shortly. In contrast to um, uh, the intervention in the, in the comparison arm, we uh, just uh, had no screening. And so there was no, um, sort of difference to, to usual care. In, in Kamau, there was no systematic active case finding um, performed by the TB program uh, during the time that we were there outside of um, our study. 
And the primary outcome for the study was the prevalence of active tuberculosis in the fourth year. Um, so what that means, just to summarize, is that we uh, conducted a cluster randomized trial. So there were 60 so-called apps or subcommunes in the intervention group and 60 in the control group that were randomly selected. And then in year one, year two, year three, there was this community-wide screening performed. Uh, and then in year four, in both of the intervention and control arms, we performed the same screening. Um, and then we looked at the prevalence of active tuberculosis based upon the use of uh, sputum expert. Um, and there's an algorithm which I can describe um, once we found people had a positive expert to confirm this. And so we also performed two sputum cultures um, using, using liquid culture to, um, to try and establish the, uh, the identity of, um, of the um, positive expert as, as being um, uh, culture positive. But, um, but I'll show you later on that we can report um, a number of different outcome definitions and, 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 uh, and, and show you the difficulty of those people. So um, there's 120 subcommunes. This is about 10% of the total population of Kamau. And you can see here that um, this is how they were selected. So they're selected um, randomly um, uh, in order that there not be adjacent sites that were um, uh, in the study um, to reduce contamination. So we had a fairly um, uh, good distribution of, of um, subcommunes across the province. Um, uh, of course, it was, complete, it was impossible to completely reduce um, contamination because people would come from these rural areas into the into the city and they may potentially um, see people who had been screened and uh, and uh, and we were also working with the TB program so it's possible that the um, the study could have strengthened the TB program over the time but but you can see that uh, geographically um, that people were discreetly um, uh, randomized into uh, into subcommunes so what happened with the um, intervention well uh, there was a process in each village uh, of engagement with the community. Um, and um, this was really important. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, there's a local um, government authority um, uh, who uh, is uh, respected by the community and uh, who uh, is persuasive and, and able to get uh, community engagement and also local health work. I work in the commune health post. And so um, we work closely with them as well as the provincial government um, and the provincial health service uh, to go and uh, engage with the community ahead of when we conducted the screening. Um, we then would enumerate the adult population and that consisted of our staff who were Vietnamese um, healthcare workers and, um, and mostly uh, the local people from, from Ka Mau um, who would go around to, to the house door to door and enumerate the population. The rationale for this is that the official government registries of the population were, were reasonably inaccurate. And so we wanted to make sure we um, captured as high a proportion of the population as we could. And we conducted verbal informed consent to participate. We then, um, after having done that, you know, the week later, we went and did door-to-door -door screening. And so this involved collection of spontaneously expectorated sputum uh, into a sputum container. Um, and uh, then we also collected the you know, history of uh, their symptoms and, and other risk factors as well. Um, but it was a very brief survey because of the large number of people we screened. And just a point to make uh, that uh, when we did the pilot study for this um, in Hanoi, um, we uh, found that about 20% of people could, could produce sputum. When we went down to Kamau, we found that in the real, uh, real life setting of the field, in fact, 50% of people were able to produce a testable sputum sample, which caused us a little bit of a, um, a, a sort of budgetary challenge. As you'd imagine, um, we were purchasing quite a lot of gene expert tests. And so after the first year, um, it was decided to, to um, pull the sputum samples in a two to one um, ratio and test them in expert. And then if either of the two samples were positive, they um, would then be retested to confirm this. Um, and the, you can refer to this publication here um, by Fuong, who was our trial coordinator, um, which uh, showed the sensitivity of that method was preserved um, and uh, therefore our budget was preserved. And then finally, um, uh, the sputum testing was performed. So um, we had a, um, a fairly large scale setup. We had a four unit, um, we had four four unit gene expert modules, uh, which were located in our lab in Kamau um, city. And so um, our staff would go out during the day and then they would bring them back by motorbike um, to the central um, lab facility. And we had a team of um, lab staff in the lab constantly doing testing about 12 to 
to 16 hours a day to keep up with the samples. And obviously that became even more challenging during the final year when we had both um, the intervention and control sites. And it took us about 12 months to complete each cycle um, of 60 screens and then 12 months to complete the final prevalence survey. This is an example of what it looked like in the field. So here's a picture of one of the Woolcock staff um, with a, a flip chart um, explaining what the study was about and educating the, um, the family here about what was involved in screening. Um, you can see Vietnam's famous plastic chairs and low tables. Um, uh, and uh, this was an example of um, the communication instructions in Vietnamese that we gave them around how to produce sputum. So obviously um, it was important to try and increase the yield of, of um, sputum production. Uh, and so we, we explained to people how to do that. Um, a lot of the patients we see in our clinics are pretty good at sputum production because they have TB and so they've been trained how to expectorate sputum. Uh, but in the general community, there's an education process required to um, teach people how to produce a good sample. And of course, a lot of it was saliva and some of it um, was not testable, but, um, but we, uh, we did a, another su a sub study where we looked at at sputum samples and it was not possible by visually looking at the sample to tell whether it would be a good quality sample or not. So this is what happened for the people who were expert positive. So um, uh, because expert can have false positives, uh, we wanted to confirm the diagnosis before initiating treatment and referring them to the national TB program. And so uh, we conducted a uh, chest X-ray as well as two further samples for smear culture and DST, which was performed at the um, uh, Cantor Laboratory, which is a couple of hours away by, uh, by bus. Um, and then we referred them to the Provincial TB Centre for assessment and then a decision around TB treatment. So if a patient had um, no evidence of active TB other than a positive expert, then they would be followed up uh, and not treated. Uh, but if they had a positive um, culture or if they had clinical evidence of, of TB, then they would be recommended for treatment. And most people um, who were recommended for treatment did initiate treatment. Um, there was a, a small number who, um, who refused. This is a, a busy slide, but I just wanted to um, put it up to show the, the sort of numbers that we were talking about in our screening. So um, in um, the uh, first year, for example, in the screening intervention period, there were 18,000 households that we screened um, and 51,000 individuals um, were um, eligible. Um, of those, um, we sought consent from 44,000 and we were able to obtain consent from 43,000. So you see here the participation rate was around 84%, um, which is, I think, an important um, uh, point to make that having high participation rate in these community wide studies is, is going to be important in order to see an effect. Um, most people were able to um, attempt sputum production, and as I mentioned before, around a half of people actually produced at least a half a mil of sputum. Now that sputum collection rate was slightly less in, in later years, um, but nevertheless, it was higher than we had originally anticipated. And I guess shows the reason why you need to do these studies in real life settings. Um, in the final year, um, we screened, um, we, we enumerated um, around 100,000 people across the two um, uh, groups, the intervention control group, and um, we were able to test um, around 83,000 people. Um, and of those, um, you can see about 40,000 people had a gene expert test. So for a while there, we were the largest um, uh, purchaser of gene expert cartridges um, in Vietnam. And you can see here um, the characteristics of the participants in the fourth year prevalence survey. So um, in Vietnam, the mean age um, is in the 40s um, in this province. Um, and uh, slightly less than a half were males, reflecting the fact that um, some of the males were often fishing boats or um, away uh, for work. Um, and that a, a minority of people had symptoms um, on the day of testing, um, a small minority. Um, smoking daily was fairly common. So if you keep in mind that about 1% of Vietnamese women smoke, this translates to around a, a 35 to 40% smoking rate in men. Um, and uh, uh, there's a majority of people who had um, health insurance, which is access to, um, to government subsidized healthcare um, and diabetes was, was very uncommon uh, based on history, but we didn't screen for diabetes. So this is the um, 
the details of the prevalence uh, in the final year. So you can see here that um, we found 53 um, people with a positive gene expert for MTB um, in the intervention group and 94 in the control group. That correlates to a prevalence of 125 per 100,000 against 225 per 100,000. Um, if you use different definitions, so if you use the definition of MTB positive and culture positive, then it was 78 per 100,000 against 120 per 100,000. And then if you use a clinical definition as well as a microbiological definition, either or, um, so either um, culture and expert positive or having a chest X-ray and expert positive, then the prevalence um, is 104 per 100,000. So either way, you can see here in this column that the prevalence ratio demonstrated that there was a reduction in prevalence between those two groups. Um, so this was our primary um, outcome here. Um, so around a 44% reduction, um, but by other definitions, there was also a reduction um, as well by a similar amount. So somewhere around 40 um, to 50%. And if you look at this column here, this shows a number needed to screen. So um, in order to um, detect a case of positive uh, MTB um, on expert, um, you'd need to screen 100 people. Uh, to get a positive culture, you'd need to screen 240 people and then 124 people for that clinical definition. And, um, and so just to, to look at culture, so um, the culture confirmation rate was around um, uh, 50 to um, 75%. Um, and so you can see here, for example, that in the final year, in the prevalence survey year, that there were 53 people who um, had a positive gene expert and 62% of those had a positive culture isolated as well. And then the culture positivity rate was slightly lower, interestingly, in the control group. And I won't go through this, all this slide in detail, but this is another paper that you might like to look at. Um, one of the questions prior to this study was, um, is uh, gene expert or, or sort of mass PCR um, going to cause um, a lot of false positives and therefore result in um, inappropriate uh, treatment and inappropriate um, referral and, and overwhelm the, the health system. And um, our um, study showed that in fact, um, in contrast to the previously calculated um, uh, set specificity of gene expert, which was I think 99.5, um, that in fact, the, um, the specificity was somewhere in the vicinity of 99.78 um, to 99.93. So in fact, higher. And this means that the positive predictive value was around 61% against culture, which um, refutes the idea that you can't use um, PCR as a mass screening tool. Um, it's a you know, reasonable thing if you have around twice as many people who have suspected TB or presumptive TB as who actually have TB. So this um, figure shows um, the sort of overall findings of the study. So interestingly, you can see between one year one, year two and year three, there was a steady decline in the uh, measured prevalence of TB in these communities. Now, I mentioned before that in year two, we started to do pooled sputum. So it's possible that some of this decline was related to that technique. Um, but nevertheless, you can see that there was clearly a, a steady progression of um, a reduction in prevalence over that time. Um, and then in the final year, which is on the right here, you can see that there was a um, substantial difference between the two groups. Um, if you compare first year to last year in, um, in the intervention provinces, there was a 72% decline in prevalence. And then if you compare the prevalence in the final year, there was a 44% reduction. And so um, uh, it's not clear whether there was perhaps um, some spillover effect of the intervention in the control arm. So maybe people were more aware of the issue of tuberculosis in the community due to local media and, um, and to uh, you know, social um, uh, communication of the, of, the, of the screening campaign, uh, or maybe there was some uh, gradual improvement in the um, in the TB program and, and treatment uh, of, of TB, whatever the case, um, there was uh, nevertheless a substantial reduction in that final year. Now, one of the um, one of the important questions then was, well, what was the mechanism for this reduction? Was this through reduced community transmission? Now, as a um, one of the um, uh, outcomes that was pre-specified, we'd we'd chosen. Um, to look at TB infection in, in young children. Now, the hypothesis was that um, if there was reduced transmission of TB in the community, then the population in which you'd be able to measure that would be the youngest children who were born at the time that the study started. And so therefore would only have been able to be, be infected um, during the study period. And so 
we had pre-specified that we would look at kids um, under who, who are age five plus or minus one year at the time of the final prevalence survey. Now, when we came to do this um, study and measure the outcome, we found that the um, prevalence of latent TB infection in that younger child group was much lower than we had anticipated. Um, and so um, as a result, we then went on to extend the screening for latent TB to children who um, were older as well. And so we conducted a prevalence survey of latent TB infection in randomly selected um, children across the intervention and control districts. Um, and, um, and you can see here that this um, second screening um, found that there was a 4.1% prevalence of latent TB infection in the intervention group and an 8.3% prevalence in the control group. And so um, if you compare these two groups, you'll see that there's a 50% reduction in latent TB in um, young children and adolescents. Now, because this was not a pre-specified endpoint, this is a, a post hoc analysis, but um, I think uh, that, uh, you know, this provides, uh, I think, evidence that there is in fact a reduction Action in commission associated with this intervention. Um, and uh, this was um, uh, therefore, I think, important as a part of explaining the mechanism behind uh, how this um, reduction in uh, prevalence that we measured might have occurred, of TB that might have occurred. And so the comparison, therefore, between the intervention and the control group is around 50% reduction. Okay. So, um, what are the implications of this? Um, so there's been a, a number of um, community-based TB screening studies, um, uh, including the Detect TB study and the ZAMSTAR study. And these uh, studies, as well as the ACT3 study, were uh, presented to the WHO guideline committee last year. And um, the guideline development group reached a um, position that systematic screening is now um, uh, recommended. So it may be conducted amongst the general population in high prevalence areas. And uh, that um, sort of setting of a threshold of 0.5% was based upon expert opinion. Um, there was uh, some differences in the outcomes of those studies that I've mentioned. Um, uh, and so although the ACT3 study showed a significant reduction um, in community prevalence, the ZAMSTAR study did not. And so um, unfortunately there was still low certainty of, um, of evidence in relation to this. But I think it, it does indicate the recognition um, by WHO of the need to be much more um, uh, broad in our focus on, on active case finding. So let's come back to the question that we started with, which is what is going to get us to ending tuberculosis? So clearly um, the undetected transmission of TB is going to um, be a continuing perpetuating factor for the TB pandemic. Um, unless we address that, we're not going to be able to uh, eliminate tuberculosis. And um, I would argue that community-based screening is going to be at the center of, um, of a campaign to, to, uh, to eliminate TB. Um, there are clearly going to be um, health system strengthening um, interventions that will be required just because you detect TB doesn't mean people complete TB treatment. Um, we had um, over 85% TB um, uh, treatment completion in our study and we followed people up post treatment as well. Um, and we'll be um, analyzing some more of those data in, in, in the coming year. Uh, but, um, but it's clearly important not just to detect, but also to be able to treat TB. And so therefore we need to be detecting uh, and treating as many cases as possible, particularly um, in high prevalence settings. And the, the interventions we use need to be um, uh, achievable in remote rural settings such as Carmel. So there's some further work that we're doing, um, looking at the cost effectiveness of this intervention. Clearly um, the cost at the current price point for Gene Expert is, is not going to be scalable, but um, uh, in fact, there are many different um, uh, alternative um, uh, technologies and algorithms which may make this cheaper over time. So for example, um, we've shown that using PCR in this context is, is effective. Um, uh, it would be quite reasonable in some settings to use low cost um, uh, mass uh, chest X-rays as was done in Australia um, uh, that, that could reduce the cost and doing a single chest X-ray, particularly if, the, um, if there's automated reading, um, can bring down the cost a lot. And, um, and so I think uh, you know, we're gonna see as we do this modeling, what is the price point um, that governments are willing to pay? And, and the other point is that when you're thinking about cost effectiveness, we need to not just think about the immediate cost, but we need to think about the long-term impact. So for example, if you model this over a 20 year time horizon, 
and look at all the averted cases uh, and all the averted morbidity mortality, uh, in fact, um, it becomes um, much more cost effective. And so there may be a need to have a, a program where governments invest ahead of time in active case finding so that they can save their health systems money and, uh, and reduce um, the burden of TB down the track. Um, it's important to evalu evaluate alternative algorithms. And so um, there are studies underway through a range of different um, funding mechanisms to do this. One of the studies um, that I'm involved in uh, with Ben Murray in Kiribati is, uh, is doing community-wide screening um, using um, uh, automated chest X-ray reading and then latent TB treatment as well. Um, and uh, the ACT-5 study, um, which I'll uh, maybe could talk about if you're interested, um, is, uh, in, is underway um, and we're screening the entire community for latent TB um, and treating them for latent TB as well as active TB and looking at the effect on community prevalence um, after two years. Um, and then we also need to think about how we can scale this up. And we've shown in, uh, in Carmel uh, that engaging the community and, uh, and really getting buy-in uh, by, by local people is gonna be essential to doing this. Um, and we need to think about how we can scale this up in a, in a practical way. Um, so this is just to say that there's a series of other studies that, um, that we've done in Vietnam looking at other elements of this problem. So the ACT2 study is looking at household contact screening, um, which will be an important part of the response. So after you screen communities for three years or how many years you need to screen them, it's going to be important to continue to do active case finding in high risk populations. And I expect that, and we need to do modelling to show this, um, that the balance between community and, and household or community and, and known contact disease is going to shift over over the course of a campaign. And so like in Australia, where we've shifted now to um, contact tracing as being our main approach to, um, to case detection, um, there's gonna be a time at which you shift from community-based screening to, to a sort of more intensive um, contact tracing model. Um, uh, with, um, with Dick and, uh, and others on the call here, the ACT4 study, as, as you would know, um, has shown the importance of um, being able to scale up latent TB treatment. And I think um, that this is again going to be an important part of the solution, at least in um, close contacts, but um, potentially in the community. And so the ACT5 study, you see we haven't finalised our logo yet, um, uh, is, uh, is underway um, in Carmel. And so we've conducted some pilot work where we've, we've um, screened uh, and are treating uh, members of the general community um, for latent TB and, uh, and are about to conduct a cluster randomised trial uh, where we'll screen um, uh, people um, who are living in the general community um, uh, and then treat them with a 3HP regimen. And then the VQIN study is looking at MDR-TB. So um, just, uh, there's obviously a huge number of people to acknowledge uh, for this study. So I guess foremost is um, Professor Nguyen Viet Nhung, who's the director of the Vietnam National TB program. And I think, you know, has a real vision for what Vietnam can achieve in terms of case finding. Um, uh, this is Nguyen Tuang, uh, who is uh, the country director of the Wilcock Vietnam. And um, as uh, Dick and others would know, is um, incredibly um, uh, effective in, uh, in leading our, our large scale studies in Vietnam. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Phuc, who is the trial coordinator for, for the ACT3 study. And she um, uh, spent uh, most of the four years of the study um, uh, either in Kamau or, or you know, overseeing Kamau uh, from Hanoi uh, to, to lead this study. And, uh, and you know, it was incredibly effective as, as an organiser. And, um, and then you see others here, um, but, uh, but Guy Marks is the principal investigator of this study. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, I just want to acknowledge his his leadership of the of the whole project. So um, I've mentioned some of those names here and some of the funding agencies that have supported the research. So I might stop sharing and then hand over to Dick again or anyone who wants to ask any questions. Yeah, so thanks, Greg. That's a very, of course, a very impressive study every time I hear about it. Um, so the chat, at least my chat, I don't see anything coming in, but uh, yes, 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 please, Bunit, go ahead. Yeah, the, it, the easiest is to use chat, but now I see, okay. Okay, so um, in fact, so Bunit, do you wanna, why don't you go ahead and ask that question? First of all, congratulations on the amazing work uh, by, by the researchers in the NTP. I just wanted to note that the prevalence threshold that WHO chose uh, after this was uh, assumed 
would have excluded the community where it was studied. Uh, and I'm just wondering for those who subsequently took the information forward and interpreted in the guideline development, if they could just comment on the on the drivers of that threshold choice for 0.5% communities uh, uh, prevalence to be really uh, the places where you want to do this kind of uh, active uh, screening intervention. Thanks. So it sounds like that's a question for those who are on the, the guideline group, which I was not. Um, but I, I would comment that um, I think this really does provide pretty persuasive evidence, um, at least in the Vietnamese context, that we, um, uh, that we should be um, choosing a lower threshold. Um, and it, you know, it's obviously important to replicate this study in different settings um, and, or at least replicate the, uh, the active community-wide screening. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's arguable that in some of the other settings that the screening algorithms that were used were not as sensitive or the participation rates were not as high. That might explain why the effects seen there were not, were not as, um, as evident. Um, for example, Detect TB at the time was using smear rather than PCR because it wasn't available. So I think, um, yeah, it's going to be important to do further work in other settings to, uh, to confirm what we've done uh, in, in Carmel. Uh, but I think the high participation rate and the use of very sensitive tests um, is, is a reason why we perhaps found a difference where some other studies did not. But yeah, I'd have to defer to the, uh, the others on the panel. I, I suspect those com conversations are probably confidential, so I don't know whether we'll be able to answer that in full. Uh, Simon, do you want to, you actually asked first, but I didn't see it. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Greg. Congratulations. Great talk. Um, we, we often see those active case finding strategies as being implemented on a one-time basis, almost like prevalence surveys in high-risk groups. Um, clearly, in your study, uh, doing this on a yearly basis had added value. Was the choice of that frequency based on feasibility or was there a rationale in terms of in, in you know improving limitation of transmission or whatsoever yeah thanks thanks for your question so yeah i think there are two considerations one was feasibility um, that is uh, we worked out it would take us about a year to screen an entire population uh, within the resources that we had um, the second is uh, the inevitable uh, duration of a grant so you know you have five years so we had to um, complete the study within that time and then the third factor is in terms of the, the natural history of tb our assumption was that if people were going to develop active tb and it was going to progress from that latent stage through to um to active tb that the time might be around a year and so that if we screened more frequently than that then we'd be less efficient in our screening now i think your your question is a good one because it's not clear how many times we need to screen or whether we could have achieved the same effect if we'd screened only twice rather than three times. Um, but we needed to choose something which, you know, which, which met those, those criteria. I think um, that you know, we, we achieved a 44% reduction um, in prevalence over that time. Um, clearly that's still not sufficient to achieve TB elimination. And so there's, I think this is where modeling is gonna play an important role in, in looking at what are going to be some of the thresholds that we should choose for how frequently we screen, for how long we screen, and then when we when we stop screening, how we um, transition to other screening um, in more targeted ways. Um, and I suspect that it's going to be an iterative process where we'll need to be measuring um, prevalence periodically to go and assess what the effectiveness is in different settings. The other point to make is that um, this is obviously in a rural setting where there's limited um, internal migration. Um, in a setting like uh, Ho Chi Minh City or Hanoi, with a lot of movement of people in and out, um, that may also change the effectiveness of the intervention because there may be um, you know, a diluting of the effect because of continually sort of re-importing the disease. And so ultimately this is gonna to need to be a national strategy um, where, where you address um, you know, the whole country at the same time, which is gonna have huge resource implications. Uh, Annette actually has sent two questions. Go ahead, Annette. Thank you, Greg. Excellent presentation and wonderful work. Uh, my question is, what do you think would happen uh, in this study or in similar inter interventions with the latest generation uh, cartridges, which are reported to have a smaller specificity? And how, yes. was, how was the incidence of side effects, uh, adverse events in your population? So yeah, they're Thank both you. good questions. Thank you. Um, 
so yeah, we didn't. We used the first generation Gene Expert cartridges, and so I, I agree that, that the um, uh, when we uh, was if we repeat this using Expert Ultra, then it, it's likely that you'd have more um, false positive results, and that potentially would result in a larger burden of, of screening. I think that uh, is, is something that's worth doing. Um, having said that, I don't think that the um, the pathway to um, mass PCR testing necessarily would require that we use a gene expert platform. And in fact, there is uh, through FIND, I understand some, um, some interest in developing sort of mass testing, large scale um, devices for, for doing PCR. And you actually, when you think about it, you don't need MTB RIF cartridges. We don't need to know about the RIF resistance. The specificity of, of that test is much lower. And, um, and we didn't use those, those data um, to, to guide treatment. We looked at the DST in the in the culture. Um, so I think, um, you know, we need to work out what are the, the best PCR methods. Uh, Marcel may, may have some views on this, but what are the best um, methods of large scale PCR testing? Um, and that may include, um, you know, the, the cost of uh, the assays coming down. It may include um, pooling assays, um, pooling samples rather as, as we did. Um, but I think, uh, you know, further work, what is the most efficient way of doing that? And then your second question, um, what was your second question? Uh, about uh, adverse events, did you look at the, the rates of? Yeah, so we didn't formally um, uh, report adverse events because we um, referred patients to the, the routine TB treatment program for, for treatment. Um, so yeah, we didn't um, uh, specifically you know, look at the adverse events of the TB treatment, but uh, there's not, uh, I don't think a reason to think that that would be any different to to the sort of the routine TB treatment, and we followed people up afterwards, and we didn't have any any um, you know deaths, uh, for example, in our um, our intervention group. And I think you probably argue that the the risks of, of TB treatment are probably justified if somebody ha you know, has, has confirmed TB. Um, I guess there's some further work that could be done looking at um, some of the psychological impacts of um, of screening, um, and I guess potential stigmatization of people who may have a positive expert test, but not have active TB. I think that's an interesting question as well. Great. Looking forward to see your cost effectiveness analysis. Yeah, that's definitely one of my questions. But anyway, I'll pass to uh, Jonathan. Great presentation, great, thanks. Um, I guess it was more just, the question was not necessarily for me, but I guess for the group and your thoughts. Um, Zamstar study did not find any kind of change in TB prevalence over time, and in your study in Detect TB, TB prevalence seemed to change pretty substantially over time. I know there's a lot of discussion on focusing first on household contacts and then moving beyond before you go into this large-scale active case finding. I just kind of want to know your opinion on maybe how you should prioritize, because clearly what was done in Sam Samstar didn't seem too effective, and I know that wasn't as extreme as what was done in Detect TB in Act 3. If you have opinions on really what to do when we're sitting in these resource limited areas, thinking what to put money towards. Mm, yeah, look, that's right. And a lot of money was invested in Zamstar, and and um, I think yeah, in some ways it was surprising that 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 didn't have an effect. But I guess one point I'd make is in in the Zamstar intervention, um, not all of the people who in, in whom the outcome measures were measured were necessarily um, eligible to receive the. The intervention. I think one of the things about the ACT uh, three study was that we we both screened the entire population and then we measured the outcome in the entire population. So um, so I think the participation rate uh, was one of the keys, um, being very high, and uh, and also um, the directness of measuring the outcome in the in the screened population. Um, uh, and then secondly, I think that there there are going to be um, clearly some factors that modify the effect of this intervention. And it may be that, um, that there are social factors that the prevalence of HIV and, and difficulties in detecting um, TB in that population um, could explain the difference. Um, uh, and so I think it's gonna be important to, to look at this in, um, in a range of different settings. And it may well be that it is less cost-effective and, and less feasible in some, in some settings. And maybe um, you know, the, the settings in which Zamstar was conducted is, is an example. Um, uh, and, uh, and I guess uh, it just emphasizes the importance that for all um, active case finding 
studies, whether they be through TB Reach or through others, that we need to be collecting data about um, outcomes, uh, not just the number of people we screen, but what the effect is on, um, on ideally on community prevalence at, as an outcome. So, um, so I think it, it really emphasizes the importance of having data to, to be able to assess this. And there may be some settings in which this approach is tested and then found not to be either feasible or effective. Thanks, Greg. Um, Kevin, do you want to? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, brilliant, Greg, and it's nice to see you. Um, the question was just um, to what extent do you think lead time could be an issue in terms of uh, when you compare the uh, the intervention and, and control uh, subcommunes? Mm, yeah, no, that's respect a, to prevalence. A, yeah, I mean, that, that's a good point. Um, I, I think um, speaking against that was. Um, our finding that we actually had a higher proportion of culture positive patients in the intervention group compared to the control group in, in year four. So it didn't seem like we had a lot of people who are expert positive and culture um, negative in the intervention group. Um, so, um, you know, as, as, be as best as we can work out, um, it, it seemed at least they, they did have um, TV. Secondly, I guess the, um, the uh, you know the measure that we use the outcome measure of um, of, of expert uh, you know should be non differential it, it shouldn't it shouldn't cause um, bias in detection um, and and in terms of the the issue of, of lead time bias um, I think it, it would be interesting to continue to follow up those populations you know one two three years afterwards and and look at notifications as well as look at um, at at, um, at the prevalence um, later on down the track as well so um, we're going to have a I guess a chance to do that a little bit in the Act Five study, where we're going to be doing another prevalence survey down the track and um, and seeing seeing whether there you know, the effect is sustained in the uh, in the intervention group compared to the control group. Thanks. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. So uh, there's not much time left, unfortunately, and there's three questions that are quite similar. So I'm going to kind of paraphrase them into one, and that'll be our last question. And sorry to everybody else, but I've been trying to sort of at least go in order. Um, so essentially, the, the, the question revolves around uh, incidents or notification rates at the same time and then subsequently, if uh, to kind of put it all together. So what were the notification rates? Taking out, obviously, the ones I, I assume you would be able to separate out the ones that were diagnosed through the active case finding. So mm. the non-active or the passive notification rates in the control and intervention uh, districts, uh, both during the time of the study and then post. Mm. So I don't unfortunately have data to, to show you today about that. And we're doing some further analysis at the moment, looking at the passive and the active cases and, and looking at those issues around notifications. I guess um, having not, not sort of looked at the um, at the data in detail, yes. Um, the, the general comment is that there did not seem to be um, a difference in um, notifications between the active and the passive groups over that time, even when you in included the extra cases that we detected. So um, yeah, as, as I said, I can't um, show you the, the data to support that now, but the, the general finding is that there was not, for example, a dramatic drop in case notifications in the intervention group. Okay, okay. So just a note to everybody who's on the call who's a PhD student, this was a good part of Greg's PhD project. So setting the bar quite high there. Greg. No, no this, 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 this was not part of my PhD. The, oh, the, Act, two, the, the Act 2 study was this, this sort of began, um, I guess, or I suppose yeah, at the end of my PhD, but it was never, never included in, in it. Okay. So right. it's okay. Um, anyway, thank, thanks. That's a great study. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of discussion, still questions coming in. I'm sure maybe people who had a question that wasn't answered can probably just email Greg directly. 